Welcome to the 153rd episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Matt Debenham, author of the story collection, The Book of Right and Wrong, published in 2010 by the Ohio State University Press. Stay tuned for the interview. The Reading and Writing Podcast is sponsored by the book-loving nerds at Riffle. Riffle is an online book community that connects readers with authors and books that they'll love. Readers use Riffle to find the next book that they want to read. And authors use Riffle to make their books stand out and drive sales. Join the Riffle community today at rifflebooks.com. That's R-I-F-F-L-E-B-O-O-K-S dot com. And look for the link in the show notes as well. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Matt Debenham. Matt is the author of the story collection, The Book of Right and Wrong, which was published in 2010 by the Ohio State University Press. His stories have been published in The Battered Suitcase, Roanoke Review, The Pinch, Painted Bride Quarterly, Dogwood, and North Atlantic Review. Matt is also the host of a relatively new podcast about books and reading. The podcast is called What Are You Reading? I highly recommend that you go and download and subscribe to his podcast. Matt, welcome to this podcast. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Sure, sure. Well, uh, at the outset, what are you reading? <laughs> I should always be better prepared for that question. Um, I am. Uh, I am reading. I've been. I'm, I mean, I'm. I've mentioned this. I think on a on a probably a couple of my own podcasts, uh, but this this will probably be new information for your listeners. But I, I've been reading um, Glenn Weldon's uh, fantastic nonfiction book called Superman, an unauthorized biography. Um, and it is, it's great. And actually why it's taking me so long is because I started the Weldon book and then he instructs the reader to, to if they want more information about the early days of Superman and in particular the... Um, uh, the the creators Schuster and Siegel um, that they should they should check out a book called Men of Tomorrow, um, which as it happens I had sort of put aside uh, some months before. So I actually followed Glenn's advice, put his book down, went to read, and I and I finished up uh, Men of Tomorrow, which I highly recommend. I don't have the author's name at my fingertips, but I can bring it up in a moment. Um, but it's about the the early days of of the comics industry, and actually. Um, uh, I, I'm trying to think if if he just uses a lot of the same sources as Michael Chabon did for the Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, uh, or if uh, Michael Chabon possibly had used this book um, as some source material. But the the intersection of several of the um, not just the motifs, but uh, but of several actually early scenes. Like there's one scene where um, I'm probably going into too much detail, but that's okay because your your podcast is all about. Uh, uh, reading as well. Yeah. Um, but, um, the, uh, the early comics creators, I mean, it's fascinating. Like there are gangsters involved, you know, like you, rec- here's the thing. It, you, you think it's just nerds. It's not, you will read this book. And in the first hundred pages, you'll recognize several names from boardwalk empire, for instance. So there are like some high level, high profile gangsters involved in the early comics industry. Um, and a lot of the writers would sort of be, be, and writers and artists would be sort of sweatshopping it uh, because they would just crank these things out. And I mean, they sold really well. Like at one point, uh, I think Superman was selling possibly 2 million copies every time, which I don't know that comics sell that well on an individual basis anymore. I don't know. Um, But, uh, but so yeah, so they'd be, they would just be huddled in these sweatshops, just cranking stuff out day and night. And if you've read Cavalier and Clay, they do this. And and in one scene in the Men of Tomorrow book, they are um, uh, they are uh, uh, in a garment district uh, office with with no real provisions. I don't think there's even plumbing there. Uh, and New York experiences this massive whiteout. There's a massive snowstorm. Can't get anywhere. And so they send one of the one of the artists out to uh, to get provisions. He decides to trek out, and I think he comes back with like eggs. And they're like, "Well, what are we going to do? There's no power. There's no gas." <laughs> uh, but they they made it work. Um, I'm trying to find the uh, the name of this. Uh, so writer. I actually I actually have another book that if you're interested in that topic that was actually just published, and and I'm working on setting up an interview with the with the author. It's nonfiction. 
Um, it was published in June. It's called Super Boys, The Amazing Adventures of Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, the creators of Superman. There you go. So, yeah, start there. Read that new one, then read Men of Tomorrow, and then read the book that I'm reading right now, which is Glenn Weldon's Superman, an unauthorized biography. Because Glenn's book, and I just interviewed him for my podcast this last week, actually. He's fantastic. Um, he's one of the hosts of Pop Culture Happy Hour for NPR, and he writes about comics and other things for NPR. Um, but Glenn's book is, uh, is, is really terrific, and it really just considers Superman, the character. So it's not as much about the history um, of the creation of Superman as it is the history of the character. Um, the author, by the way, of, of Men of Tomorrow is Gerard Jones. Got it. Got it. So I, I don't want to, this to seem like I'm trying to recreate an episode of your podcast, but, but <laughs> I, I was curious. What, what were kind of the formative books for you uh, when you were a kid or, or even later as a teenager? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, that's no problem. Um, I was actually a relatively late reader. Uh, I couldn't read it all through, I believe, kindergarten um, and was really embarrassed by that and sort of struggling with it. And, and you know, later, and I mean, like when I was in my 30s, I discovered that I had probably grown up um, ADHD and then possibly also with this thing called a nonverbal learning disability, which one of my sons has. Um, but I didn't know that at the time. And my, my mom said, well, we just we just thought we'd take you off sugar. Um, and so that's because that's what you did in the early seventies. But, um, so I, I think that probably contributed, I'm going to guess to my, 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 uh, late blooming reader status, but I learned to read, I believe it was the summer between kindergarten and first grade. And, um, with the help of the easy reader, Morgan Freeman on, uh, on, uh, electric company, as a matter of fact. Um, I and the nice thing, that. the nice thing is I got to meet him once and I got to thank him for teaching me to read. Uh, and then I had to watch while his wife uh, made him hold uh, her purse, even though he was about to do an interview. She was very mean to him. But anyway, <laughs> that's a whole other thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I remember the um, actually the the Ezra Jack Keats books, um, which I read in first grade. And so when I learned to read, I, I just I went at it with a vengeance and was just making up for lost time. And also I had a really, really nasty first grade teacher, Mrs. Ballantyne who would, she'd do stuff like hold you in at recess and scream at you if you got a D on something. And she was grading in first grade, by the way. I don't know if kids today get to experience that until like, geez, fifth or sixth grade, probably. Um, but she was grading A, B, C, D. And uh, she would she would hold me in and, and yell at me for getting a D on something. Um, but the one thing that, w- that would impress her was my reading ability. Uh, and so I aimed everything at her. Uh, and I remember a lot of, lot of Maurice Sendak. But the, the stuff that really... Um, that sort of turned a key in me at an early age was Ezra Jack Keats. Um, Goggles, in particular, um, was was amazing, and I just it just was this world that I wanted to live in. Um, and it was interesting. Yeah, you know, it's interesting to look back at that. My kids went both went through an Ezra Jack Keats period, and and it's I'm always curious as to what it is that kids um, gravitate towards in those books. I just they're gorgeous. Um, if you've never seen one, pick one up because they're they're these great sort of the backgrounds are, are often um, collages. Um, he seems to paint over newspaper a lot. So there's little scraps of, of newspaper stories sticking out everywhere. It just looked unearthly to me and yet so weirdly familiar. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with those. I'll have to go and check them out. Yeah, well, he was an interesting guy. I, uh, Ezra Jack Keats, if I'm not mistaken, he was a, he was a white artist, white writer artist. But um, all the characters that I know of anyway in his books are black kids um living in um the projects in new york city um it's a very 60s 70s thing i guess um and uh and but they're 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 great and they just celebrate being a kid and it happens to be in these surroundings you know um but they're just they're they're really wonderful books so goggles was the one that really spoke to me um as i got older um, it was harder. I remember it being, you know, eight or nine or whatever, being sort of hard pressed to find anything that I really loved. And then I and then I read Tom Sawyer in the fourth grade, and I just I decided, well, I love this so much, and uh, I think I, I think like we'd read a chapter of it in class. We didn't read the whole book, but I, we read a chapter, and that was enough to hook me. And so I read the whole thing on my own. And I have this great edition. I don't know where we got it, but it's it's this amazing. Uh, early 20th century edition with these gorgeous color plates. It's like it's an incredibly delicate book. I don't know how I managed not to wreck it, um, but I did. I treated it with a lot of respect, um, and I, I I must have read it 
seriously like five or six times through the course of fourth grade. I just I was like, well, I found the book, so I might as well just stick <laughs> with that one. Um, and then in fifth grade, I did the same thing with The Hobbit. I would just read these over and over again. Um, and then I was, you know, I was, I was something of a reader, uh, but more of a more of a D and D player. And then in high school, um, I discovered Stephen King, who is still very important to me. And I was lucky enough to see him uh, speak in Hartford uh, a couple weeks back. Um, and uh, he's how he's, was that? It was, you know, it was really great. He was interviewed by a. Um, uh, a Connecticut, uh, or the the host of a Connecticut NPR affiliate, uh, who does I, I guess a, a a book show or a, some sort of um, culture talk show, and um, and the interview uh, was was really good, and it was just you know two people on a stage and Stephen King, sort of holding forth. It was just, I mean I he could have come out and read you know and read his ten ninety nine, and I would have been just delighted to have seen him. Sure, sure. but luckily he was also really funny. Really, um, very sardonic. Actually, uh, it's it was it was interesting. I actually saw a couple people around me leave. It wasn't like people left in droves, but a couple people left because uh, I think partly because he was swearing so much <laughs> and so freely. Um, and it's kind of it's like, have you ever read Stephen King? I know, really. Yeah, it's all there. He is like he is in his books. He is, you know, the, one of the things that I that I that I love about Stephen King that I wasn't aware was a thing about him when I was first reading him is, is the fact that he's always there as a narrator. So even, and he's a master of the close third person. He's someone I've, uh, I think I really absorbed a lot um, when I was reading him, didn't even realize it, but he's really a master of the close third person, but he's also a master of moving between those modes of, um, of close third, um, third person limited, and then the omniscient voice. And his omniscient voice is, him he's really he's so present in all his books i think that's really what people love about stephen king books they say they love to to be scared but that doesn't account for the non-horror books doing so well um they say they love they love the characters and and i think that's absolutely true to some degree but i think it's it's the fact that he's always there with you the reader uh i think it's his voice and i think it's the same thing people loved about dickens um or jane austen it's the it, it's that thing where you can feel the author is beside you, a little hand on your shoulder, not guiding you, but just just there, and you can feel sort of their excitement at you discovering what they've written. So I think that's that's something that I that I tapped into with Stephen King. Sure. Um, and and in later, fact, I don't know if you've read the Dark Tower series, but he is a presence, literally. In the, oh in no, that I, series. I haven't. I, it's you, really you funny. haven't. There, there's actually there's actually like this really meta uh, fiction element, and I can't remember if it's in the sixth or seventh book where the characters meet him. Oh my God. Wow. That's and, and, great. And just the way that he does it. I mean, he's basically, uh, it, it's a scene where, um, uh, God in my mind just went totally blank, but the gunslinger, whatever his name is, Roland um, something, yeah, right? yeah, Roland DeShane, the gunslinger, you know, comes to, to, you know, this version of America. And at that point it was like the 1970s and they're driving around rural Maine and they end up, um, at like his summer house and he's there like working on a story and like comes out and there's actually an, an, <laughs> an encounter between Stephen King, the person and, and the characters in the story. That's um, great. And, and I've read some interviews about his thought process behind doing that, but, um, it, it's kind of interesting. Let's well, see him and, and Philip Roth. Who knew? I know. But you, um, you start to say, I interrupted, you start to say about The Dark Tower. You haven't read that series. I haven't read the series. And it was, it's one of those, I, 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 I was a really, I, it's funny. I remember myself being a really hardcore Stephen King fan. But if I'm, if I'm honest about it, I read maybe half a dozen of his novels. Um, yeah, I think I read Firestarter twice for some reason, um, just because I liked it so much. But I, I read, you know, it was a half a dozen, maybe nine of his books. And then sort of moved on from there. Um, and so I, I never went back. And there's a ton. Like, I, I never. I'll tell you, It came out. Mm-hmm. Um, and when It came out was when I was I was already or just done sort of for that anyway with Stephen King. Um, and so I missed It. I missed uh, Needful Things. I missed a whole bunch of stuff. Um, that I'd love to go back and read. Um, yeah, needful things you can pass on, but it definitely. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> it, I mean, seriously. I mean, I'm not. Uh, but but it. 
uh, definitely I would recommend. And yeah, mis- everyone. And misery, the, misery the book, if you've never read that. Nope, never um, read it. Oh, you definitely should, because that that's really, before he wrote his book, his nonfiction book about writing, that's really a book. I mean, obviously, we all know at this point, since it's such a part of popular culture and the and the Kathy Bates uh, mm-hmm. version of Annie Wilkes. I mean, the, the book, though, is really about the process of writing, because this guy is held captive, but he's he's escaping into the story. Um, oh, neat. That, that she's forcing him to 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 write, and he really, you know, there's a lot of discussion about kind of the the power of story, um, mm-hmm. uh, and and really really well done. I would recommend that. So, and and I I realized after our uh, interview on your podcast. Uh, the, the one thing that we did not talk about, well, a few things, and one of them was Stephen King, but anyway, um, so, so as I mentioned earlier, you, you have a short story collection that was published by Ohio State University Press. I'm yeah. curious, I'm curious, have you also worked on novels in addition to your short stories? Um, less successfully. Um, I, I did write, I, I spent a lot of time actually after that book was, was done. Yeah, that book was a funny thing because I, I, I had, I had written it in batches uh some of it in grad school some of it afterwards and then i had submitted the whole what i thought then was the whole manuscript in in 2008 i guess to a bunch of contests because if you're a a short story writer certainly an unknown short story writer um it's very very hard to get your first collection published um by a major publisher it's very hard even and and i learned this it's very hard to get uh, an agent to talk to you uh, because and, and I don't begrudge them because you know what's ten percent of nothing um, you know and, and it really it's really true because at that point in the in the late uh, in the first decade of, of the two thousands um, we um, you know you could you could see for, you know advances for first time novelists going down already they were, they were you know barely anything compared to what they had been even ten years before and so for short stories it was even less so I, I didn't begrudge anybody this and i and i had a, a i ran into actually as it happens a, a former writing teacher from from grad school who said oh submit to contests that's what everyone's doing now every, every everyone i know is doing including like peers of hers so i'm like all right let's let's try this um and so I, I submitted to a bunch of short story manuscript contests in 2008 and i didn't uh, well, actually, even before I heard back, I started, I was, <laughs> I realized I was like, boy, I really don't like a lot of these stories. I'm going to rewrite this. So I'd started rewriting it, luckily enough, as it was out, just to keep myself occupied, because I wasn't sure the next thing I was going to write. Uh, and so uh, I heard back that I did not win any of the contests. And I was like, oh, that's fine, because this is going to be so much better. So I spent the next, you know, uh, most most of the next year rewriting the manuscript, including adding a uh, completely new story um, called Failure to Thrive. Um, and uh, just as a, I was like, well, I, I think I think the story belongs in there. Uh, and as it, it's weird because it as I mean, not that it's a huge story, but as it happens, it's the one that I get asked about the most. Um, it's really funny because it, it just was not going to go in there originally. Um, but I submitted everything in, in 2009 to a, a few different contests and and I got the call from Ohio State University and just cried just wow. absolutely cried uh and so but then the next x number of months there um uh, it was was a lot of just sort of waiting um and um you know it's it's a it's a small press it's a university press and they don't have a huge staff and so actually I was the editor in that book um I was not the copy editor there was a copy editor who would who would come back and say, you know, uh, you know, this, this wording is weird or, you know, consider, you know, deleting, uh, or not deleting, but, uh, you know, should this be capitalized? It was, it's all that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, during that process, I would try to sneak, I would try to change some of the lines or try to sneak new phrasings in as I was reading through it for copy editing and I'd get them in, but they were like, you can't change, like we took the book, so you can't really change the essence of, of these stories. Um, so luckily I was pretty happy with them and, I, and I'd reworked them a, a good amount by the time it went in. Um, so yeah, I was, I was effectively the editor for the, for the book, um, or you can say alternately it went unedited. Um, so, you know, what you see is, is what you get, I guess. Um, but um, so after that, after that was in and all done, I was waiting for it to come out. I started working on a novel. And I wrote a 550-page novel 
um, that was uh, about a few things, but it was largely about a uh, actually a male. It was a comedy about a male stripper um, who strips for women. He's always adamant about that, um, and and a, that. But that industry is sort of changing and crumbling, um, and or it was when I was writing the book. Um, and I, I finished the book and then, um, I think magic Mike was about to come out, which I still haven't seen, but it just took the wind out of my sails. I was like, Oh shit. They're like writing about kind of the same thing. And I, I realize now it's not the same thing at all. It's, it's completely, I, I think the guy's pretty successful in magic Mike and my guy is just not. Um, <laughs> and the reality of that, of that industry, um, I didn't, I didn't, it's funny. I, I want, I kept making an appointment to go see this one cause they, 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 um, it's not a thing like like female exotic dancers where you can you can go to a strip club and see a bunch of women dance. Um, there are places like that in other parts of the country, but in the Northeast there really aren't. What there are is sort of these roving groups of of dancers um, who go to like bars for like you know it's ladies' night on Saturday at the Copa, and the the guys will come and do their strip thing there. Um, but they there's no like Chippendales club here anymore i think those things exist in like las vegas and atlantic city and that's kind of about it and then there's this whole subculture and i worked this in to my book actually there's this subculture um with uh with african-american clubs in the south um because um uh women feel safer there they say um so the i was reading all these articles there's actually someone's working on a documentary right now about a, a black strip club in atlanta uh, an all-male strip club for women in Atlanta, and there are all these quotes from these women saying, "Well, I just feel safe here, and it's and it's a place where I'm not going to get hit on, and I can hang out with my friends." So it's a completely different thing um, from the way I think most people would picture it, um, and it's and it's really it's the strangely specialized industry. <laughs> um, black guys dancing for black women, but there there's and I know there's there are I think Magic Mike takes place in Florida, for instance. So I think there's there's something of it there but um but in most of the country it's not the case it's it's these roving bands of of uh of dudes for hire um so i thought that was really interesting and i was and i was working it in there were other characters doing other things in the book and i'm going to go back to it at some point but i spent two years on it and it was just it was exhausting and i just i i had completely lost my way and i know that's and i teach and it's one of those things you know physician heal thyself um because i know that's the nature of the first draft uh, and I've and I've I've guided students through the first draft and second drafts of novels um, because you know I, I know story structure and I know development and so forth. Um, but for me, I just I need a break from that. So I'm going to go back to it, and I've been working on something in the meantime um, that I'm much happier with. Great, great. So when did you first start writing fiction? Um, I think pretty late compared to most people I know. I you know you always. Or I feel like I always maybe I'm just highly tuned to this out of a sense of uh, out of a sense of, um, of uh, I don't know what um, dis- self disappointment. But um, um, I feel like you always read those those articles where someone's like, "Yep, I was you know as soon as I could write, I was three years old and I wrote my first book uh, and you know quote unquote published it." Um, and I, I wasn't that. Um, I was the kid. All I all I knew about writing was that was that for. Maybe a couple minutes in the in the school day, um, I could be the funny guy because we we had vocabulary sentences. Um, I think every Friday in the fourth grade, and and so you had to write sentences using the vocabulary word in the proper context, demonstrate your your grasp of the word, um, and so I would write funny sentences, and they would always get a laugh. My fourth grade teacher did not like humor, um, and he was. He was a, he was ill suited for teaching fourth grade. He was a he was a high school football coach <laughs> who ended up teaching a bunch of fourth graders, and so this was not a good situation for either of us. Um, so I think he stopped those after a while. But I, I did what I could with those. But I, I never did anything with fiction until college. Um, I I wrote I and I don't know what it was that even moved me to do it, but I, I was it was the summer between sophomore and junior year. It was actually the summer before I met my wife. Um, and, uh, and I had a typewriter that I'd gotten for college, uh, to write papers on. And I just started writing a story and it was a complete ripoff of something wild, by the way, with, uh, uh, Jeff Daniels and Melanie Griffith. <laughs> it was, a, it was about a guy who, 
brings uh, a girl that he barely knows to his high school. Re- I mean, it was literally the, it was the same plot uh, that he brings her to his high school reunion, and and then. But it, I, instead of having a Ray Liotta character come in from her past, I had something else happen. But that's you know, it was the same story. Got it. And and at what point did you decide that you were going to pursue an MFA? Um, I, ugh, my wife loves this story. Um, we were, uh, we'd had our second child. We'd moved from Brooklyn to Connecticut and we're dealing, uh, as you know, with all the culture shock that comes from having lived in the city for a number of years and then moving to a small place in New England. Uh, and we, we both grew up in, in Massachusetts, so New England is not, is not foreign to us, but it's still, I, I was shocked at how foreign it was after 10 years in the city. Um, but anyway, so we're, I think my wife was out of work. She's a TV producer. So they're, they're, they're frequently between, between gigs. And, and I was, I was doing freelance public relations for a couple of different companies, but it wasn't quite coming together. And we just had this talk. I was very unhappy. And oh, and I'd been to, um, I'd been to a, a week of, uh, uh, sorry, a week long um, writers workshop at uh, the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, Massachusetts, which I recommend to anybody. They have fantastic writers teaching there. Um, but I, I'd done a week with Paul Wasicki, um, with whom I'd, I'd, I'd done like a weekend thing uh, the previous fall. But this was this was summer of it would have been two thousand two. Um, and, uh, and I came back from that and I was just, and I don't think I'd ever been quite this, I'd I'd experienced depression before, but this was like, I just felt a complete, um, I felt like someone had died when I came back. Like I came back to, uh, like a three month old baby and family and this new house and all these possibilities. And I just, I just felt like someone had died. Like I was just, and that I couldn't tell anyone about it. It was like this weird secret funeral that I'd been to after this week in Provincetown, which had been a great week. And it's really funny because the story I brought was terrible and really just, it was, it was just, it was brutal. And at one point it was like this, it was an excerpt of a novella that I'd written. Actually, it was a 20, we had 20 pages. Um, and I, I thought it was so fantastic. And I brought in copies for everybody. We passed them around and then, uh, we got to my day and, and everyone was like, well, you, you know, you really, you spent 20 pages kind of, uh, giving a lot of her thoughts. I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, that's a lot of, you know, that's, that's, that's how the story is structured. And they're like, yeah, yeah. And then Paul sort of sat me down later and he said, have you ever considered using scenes? <laughs> I was just like, ow, oh, wow. Yeah, no, I hadn't. And so we did this amazing scene exercise um, that completely just changed my life. This, this like one class exercise just completely made me go, oh, I get it. It's one of those weird things where I just, you know, I, I didn't make a connection between what I knew I'd read a million times in a million different books, and I'd read some great books, I wasn't aware of what was going on in the books. Uh, and I was like, well, it's okay just to have someone standing there thinking in the mirror for 20 pages. No one's, no one's going to question that. Um, and, so, but I, but I, and so I was just elated and really filled with all this possibility. And then I came home from the, from the workshop, and, and I, was just, I was just, I mean, despondent and, and moody. And my wife was like, what the hell is wrong with you? And I was like, I don't know. And then she's like, well, you need to come up with, with a plan because, you know, we need jobs and we need this and that. And I said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to come up with, I'm going to come up with an idea. And I came back to her. Uh, and I, and I really, I really did try to think, uh, but I, but in my broken brain, I came back to her and I was like, I know what I'm going to do. And she said, what? And I said, I'm going to get my MFA in fiction. <laughs> That's going to solve all our money problems, <laughs> yeah. all our everything. But I mean, I have to say, like it's and we and we still we joke about it. Um, it also it also it's a really function. It's a really useful uh, m- moment. It's one of those teachable moments that people talk about. Um, it's a really useful moment because we joke about it, but then it also comes up in arguments. <laughs> so it's a great, ah. it's a great great tool. It really has a life of its own. This story, <laughs> and as it should, because it's pretty jackassy. I look back and I kind of cringe, but. Um, it actually was besides getting married and having kids, it was absolutely the best thing I've ever done with my life. Um, the, and, and I'm, I'm talking as a person, like I just completely, I, I worked my ass off the first two semesters. Um, but I, I just wasn't getting it. And then I, um, I, I, there was a teacher for my third semester that you only get, and you only get four semesters. So I was really sort of panicking because I was like, wow, I'm just not developing as a writer the way that I wanted to. 
Um, and she, I think, recognized the fact that I wasn't listening and I wasn't, um, I wasn't interested in really fixing my stuff. I was interested in having someone tell me my stuff was good. Uh, not the same thing, <laughs> not the same thing as being a good writer at all. Um, and she recognized that. And I think I came at it in a very clever way. And that really, that really changed things for me. Um, but it was, it was a fantastic experience and I still have wonderful friends from then. And, and what was that process like for you to, to, to be, you know, having read all of these hundreds of books over the years, if not thousands, and then, Oh, not thousands. Okay. Well, (laughs) as as, as you, as you mentioned, um, you know, writing the scene of the woman, you know, for 20 pages standing in front of the mirror and and it's her (laughs) thoughts and, and what, and, and, you know, you were saying the first two semesters, what was the process like for you to, to learn how to kind of craft a, a narrative and to craft scenes? What was, what was interesting was that, so by the time I got to, to Bennington, I was, I was writing scenes out the wazoo. I mean, I, I was great at scenes. Um, what I wasn't great at was adding them up to anything. Um, and, and what I wasn't great at was, um, was editing myself and, um, I wasn't great at, and I think, and I know that my second semester teacher, who's this amazing patient woman, who I'm, I'm so glad I'm still friends with her, uh, named Alice Madison. Uh, she wrote a great book, a, a number of great novels, but one called The Book Borrower that listeners might know. Um, and uh, she's a she's a Connecticut resident like me, um, but she she recognized that I was not being true to my characters, that I was constantly trying to maintain control at all times and that I was trying to push them to do certain things because I wanted to achieve a certain effect. And I think she recognized, uh, as my, my next teacher did, Mary Beth Hughes, that I was, um, I was not interested in the least in what the, the story was really about. I was interested in what I wanted the reader to get out of the story. That's, those are two very different things. So Mary Beth's idea with me because I, I brought in for her for her workshop, I, it was her and David Gates, um, and uh, and the story did okay, um, but it um, in terms of feedback. But I knew there was something wrong with it. It was, and this was a big turning point because I was like, I know there's something I'm doing here that I've done all along that I thought was working that is possibly the thing that Alice has been trying to tell me about, uh, but I couldn't put my finger on it, and and someone. I don't remember who it was in the workshop just said it just seems like a pile, like a, like a car crash of like events and like, and you're hoping that it'll add up to something for us. And I was like, Oh, got me, you know, because I know I'm sure at the moment I was like, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, But in my mind I was like, Oh, they got me totally. They nailed me. They nailed me. And so when I met with, with Mary Beth to talk about how we were going to work over the next semester, she said, you know, um, that story was pretty long for what happened in the story. And I was like, really? It's only 20 pages. And she was like, how long have your stories been on average? And I was like, oh, I've, I was turning in some 40-page stories, uh, some 30-page stories. And, you know, this is like Alice Monroe can get away with that, you know? Um, it, it, there, there are writers who can, who, can, who can turn out a great 40-page story. Um, I, in my second semester of getting my MFA, was not one of them. Um, and I think Mary Beth realized that, okay, this is, this is part of the problem. And so she said, for our semester together, you are to write 20 pages maximum per month. And I was like, that's nothing. That's, I can do that. Um, and she said, but you are going to write more than one story. And I was like, oh, that's a problem. Um, cause I'd never written anything shorter than 20 pages. I just, I just would write and write and write and I would never edit and I would never, because I was, I would never. I was afraid to ask myself, "What is really going on here? What is the story about?" I would just say, "Well, it's entertaining. It moves from point A to point to point B to point C. It tells a whole story. That's enough." And it's and there's another ingredient that I wasn't considering, um, and that's the story underneath the story. In other words, okay, so you know, the story's all about a two people in a bank robbery, and and they, you know, whatever. But, you know, what is the story really about? Um, and you know, any story that you like, whether it's a short story or a novel, any, any tale or story that you like, um, as an adult, I think if you look at it, you realize it is about something other than purely what happens on the page. Um, and so that was a big, that was a big deal for me. And so that, that kind of broke me in a really good way. Um, and I, and I wrote my first ever, I, I not only, I took her challenge. I not only wrote under 20 pages, 
but I think I gave her 15 pages. Um, I gave her one 10-page story and one five-page story, and they both ended up going into the book in very, very different versions uh, a couple of years later. But, um, but I, yeah, I wrote a five-page story, and I couldn't believe it. That's great. Well, I know that you teach creative writing yourself now. How do you think that teaching has has impacted or changed your own fiction writing? It's interesting. I've I've heard other writers say this. Um, it's it's a mixed bag, truly. Um, on one hand, I have learned so much in teaching because, you know. And this is probably obvious to your listeners, but it wasn't, again, I'm a little slow in the uptake. I, I have trouble making connections sometimes between things. <laughs> um, but um, I, I learned really quickly that that um, the way I understand it has to be uh, phrased in such a way that a group of people is going to understand it. And I, and I, I realized after about class one or two, I was like, this is, I got to find a new way of explaining this stuff. Um, and so it, it forces you to, um, to consider things from other people's point of view. Uh, it forces you to really be able to verbalize your ideas about storytelling. And it seems like that'd be an easy thing because we all grow up, you know, we, we, some of us are read stories while we're in the womb. Like we grow up with stories that's in our blood. And I think it's, and I think storytelling is, is a, is a primal urge. I think it's in us. Um, and, um, you know, they always talk about how, how some, huge percentage of our DNA is just junk left over from, from, uh, you know, prehistoric days. And I think you know, part of that junk might be storytelling. I think it's just in us, um, you know, the need to connect with other people, the need to connect through narrative. Um, and so I, 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 the, the whole process of, of, of learning how to verbalize that stuff, um, has been really amazing. Um, and I feel like I've, I've become a vastly better reader, even than I, even than I was in, in grad school. Um, I got to, you know, you said you, by the time I got to grad school, I'd read hundreds, if not thousands of books. I really wasn't kidding when I corrected you. Like I was really not widely read, um, and, or well read. And, um, uh, when I got to my first semester, I, I sat down with my teacher who, thank God, she was very sort of classic old school, amazing, um, South African writer, uh, named Sheila Kohler. Uh, and she's, she writes these great creepy wonderful books, uh, one of which was made into a movie fairly recently called Cracks, uh, about a murder at a girl's school. Um, but, um, but she said, what if, what have you read? And I said, um, not much, fill me up. And so my, my first book, my first book for grad school was Anna Karenina. Uh, and then from there, I think I read, uh, David Copperfield. And then I read, um, uh, I think I read crime and punishment, like all these things that I should have read. I read Scarlet Letter for the first time in grad school. Um, just all the stuff that I should have read probably in high school or at least in college. Uh, I finally read in my early 30s in grad school. and It was, it was great. Um, and so I, I've become a much, much smarter reader even since then, though, because for my students, I have to think constantly, OK, but how does this work? How does this work? Um, you know, it's 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 not enough to know that, you know, um, you know, so and so is 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 you know has great dialogue. You can't just hand a student a story and go, "This has great dialogue." Uh, enjoy, you know, learn something from it. You have to talk about what it is that makes the dialogue great. And so, as I've taught, I've taught for four years now, which is not an enormously long time. Um, but I, I teach in a variety of settings, and that's really been fantastic in terms of challenging me um, uh, to come up with new ways of of explaining things and demonstrating things, um, demonstrating aspects of of fiction and craft. Um, I teach in a, in a, at a weekly workshop, uh, a couple times a week, actually at a, at a local workshop here in Westport. Um, I taught online for UCLA, uh, for their extension, uh, writers program, which is, which is to teach online is a completely different thing. You don't have anyone in front of you. You've got to write it all out. Like it really, if nothing else, it'll make you into a good blogger. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and then I've taught, um, I taught undergrad. Uh, I did a PR writing course last semester um, at West Western Connecticut State University, and I've also taught in the graduate course, uh, graduate uh, the MFA the MFA program there, which I'm still in and still teaching in. Um, and all those settings are completely different. And I've taught 
workshops in a couple of different settings and even the workshop between let's say the local like if i do like a a three-hour craft workshop on a saturday um that's all about scene ha 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 uh which now i can teach that workshop uh because now i know what scene is um i i'll teach it I, i taught it at westcon and i taught it locally here and it was a completely different experience even though i was using the exact same powerpoint the whole the whole thing was a completely different experience because of who I was teaching, because of the ages, because of the experience level, because of uh, the environment. It was just completely different. So you, you do learn a lot of those things, um, and, it, and it's really invaluable because you really do learn about your craft when you have to talk about it. Um, but at the same time, it is, like I said, it's a mixed bag, and I think one of the things is that, and I'm trying to, it's a thing that I fight every day, but you become so, you become so much more aware of that critical voice in your head, and so much more aware of well, so and so already did this, you know, um, so and so already. It's it's almost like you know when you're in a band, if you're in a band making original songs when you're 16, um, you're probably just going to make whatever comes out of you, and if you're in a band at 36 doing original songs, you're going to self censor a lot more because you're going to go well. That's kind of Beatlesque, and that oh, that's a ripoff of Elliot Smith, and oh, that sounds like uh, uh, the Dresden Dolls. Yeah, no, no, and you're gonna just shut down all these ideas. So that's one of the things that I um, I wouldn't say struggle with, but that I that I work against. It's it's an added little companion um, to my workspace when I write fiction. Is is this idea of just shutting off that critical voice, which I think is you know it's helpful to be able to do because I'm certainly not the, not the first author who's who's also a teacher. Sure. Sure. So what, what advice do you have for aspiring writers who, who may be listening, who would like to try to get their own short stories or even novels published? Uh, number one, learn how to write scenes. Um, <laughs> number two though, I mean, it's it, it, just jumping off that thing that I just talked about actually is don't write to, I mean, it's it's a funny thing. You should have a critical voice in your head. You should have a voice um, at least after your first draft. <laughs> Let's say I, I always tell my students write your first draft um, with a sort of like you're sort of like a hippy dippy everything goes kind of guy. Um, and so you're like, oh, it's all good. Whatever goes in there, whatever comes out of me is good. But then your subsequent drafts, you want to be the hippie's older surgeon brother. Uh, you know. All right, this is shit. This is crap. Just, just cut this. Just cut this. Um, you know, you want to be really brutal with yourself in in later drafts, um, but uh, but really be free um, at the outset. So yeah, learning to sort of balance the the critical voice that you need versus the critical voice that will hinder you. It's a really learning to distinguish between those two things because there really are two voices. And I'm willing to bet the one that wants to hinder you is like is whoever it is in your in your life who's most negatively influential uh so maybe it's like it's your dad's voice or it's a teacher's voice i I, when i came out of the mfa program the hardest thing i had the hardest thing to do was not writing new stuff it was it was tuning out all my teacher's voices because i'd I'd written so much and i still that was a problem still coming out of mfa was that i had written for my teachers i was writing to impress just like i was reading to impress when i was six with mrs ballantyne um and so i would i would say don't write to impress anybody um, do write for a reader who is you, you know, write what, and you've heard this before everybody, but write what you would want to read because, you know, when you go to, into a bookstore and you see that sort of sea of books in a Barnes and Noble, if you can still find one near you, um, or the library, you know, there will be a little voice that pops up that says, uh, what can I possibly add to this? Why, why me? You know, what do I have to, to offer here? All these books are already here. Um, more than anyone could read in a lifetime. And the voice that you want to have come in is the voice that says, hmm, why not me? That's great advice. So what are you working on now? Um, a couple things. I'm, I'm, I blog and I've, I've been somewhat lax in blogging. I've been, I've been cut back to sort of one post a month on my blog and, I, I'm, and I've been writing a sort of pair, what I think is two related pieces about uh, the sort of intersection of TV and uh, and prose fiction. Because I, I watch a lot of TV, which I always have to qualify and say I watch a lot of good TV. <laughs> um, but, you know, Breaking Bad, The Wire, Mad Men, that kind of stuff. Um, but um, but I'm, I'm really fascinated in the way that TV works as a storytelling medium. 
um, because um, I think there are a lot of crazy contradictions in it. You know, you have this amazing, you know, TV really is about the characters. If you are not writing good characters, people will not watch your show. Simple as that. You can have all the premise in the world because you can look at every, I mean, I can't even name some of the shows, all those sort of lost ripoffs that were on after Lost came. There was the one with the blackouts, uh, like like where everyone blacked out for a minute and a half or whatever. Um, all those shows, um, you know, and they're all, they were all premise and no character and people just tuned out. And I, I think that TV understands beautifully and more so even than, than a lot of fiction people I've heard weirdly enough, but it understands beautifully that it really does hinge on character at the same time. TV is designed to never let the characters fully develop, um, because then the show would be over and then there would be no more advertising money. Um, so it, it's, it's this crazy set of contradictions that I'm completely fascinated with, um, that I've, I've been blogging, I've been preparing blogs about that'll go up soon. Um, I'm also, I'm working on a novel right now that I don't want to say too much about, um, but it's about some people. Um, and, uh, <laughs> some um, people doing stuff, some people, oh, oh, they haven't done that yet, but yeah, oh, okay. they're, okay. they're, they're just yeah. staring in the mir- in mirrors for now. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> no, they're, I've been really do careful stuff in the second draft. Yeah, no, I've been really careful to avoid mirrors at all. I'm like a vampire at this yeah. point. Um, and then I'm, um, I do have a couple of short stories, uh, that I'm, that I'm working on and I'm, I'm debating. I, the last couple of short stories I did, I, I experimented with self publishing, um, and I'm, I'm debating going back to sending these out and seeing how I do with, uh, with short story magazines. I'm not sure. Got it. So where can people find you online? They can find me at mattdebenham.com. Um, or they can check out my, uh, what are you reading podcast at what are you reading dot libsyn.com. That's L I B S Y N. Or they can find it on iTunes. It's weird. There is a comics. I didn't realize this till after long after I'd started the, the podcast, but there happens to be a comics discussion podcast i want to say out of australia that is also called what are you reading um so if you look up <laughs> if you just type in matt debenham on itunes you'll get the right one got it and i'll have a link to that in the show notes oh we'll, thank you uh, yeah sure well again we've been speaking with matt debenham author of the story collection the book of right and wrong and the host of the podcast what are you reading so go buy his book read his stories and listen to the podcast matt thanks for doing this interview thank you jeff i appreciate it 